I'm very happy to welcome all of you here today to Cebu um, to our uh, public-private dialogue on inclusive business. Um, we have a jam-packed schedule. I'm going to get straight to the super exciting part, the safety briefing, um, <laughs> which will be um, uh, told to us, I suppose, by uh, someone from the APEC team. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Manila Hall, Marco Polo Plaza. For your safety, there are three emergency exits in this hall, all of which are located to the south. In case of fire or earthquake, security personnel will escort you to the assembly area located at the parking lot in front of the building. Do not use the lifts. Instead, use the emergency exit stairwells to vacate the building. If you have any medical concerns, medical assistants are stationed right outside this hall while the clinic is located on the 8th floor at rooms 803 and 805. For your personal necessities, the restrooms are located at the right side of this hall towards the west. Thank you and have a good day. Let's give the safety briefing a round of applause. Okay, um, so once again, uh, good morning. Um, we have a jam-packed schedule. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting next five or six hours. Um, and so uh, without further ado, um, we're going to get straight to, um, or I'm going to get straight to introducing our first speaker. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome on stage our first speaker, um, an exemplary public servant. Um, whose breadth and depth of experience in SME development is probably second to none. Um, throughout her career, uh, the next speaker has served as director for the Bureau of Trade, uh, Domestic Trade Promotions, assistant secretary for regional operations, um, and project manager of the One Town, One Product uh, program of the Philippines. She was also undersecretary for consumer welfare and business regulation and currently serves as uh, the Undersecretary of the Regional Operations Group of the Department of Trade and Industry uh, Philippines, where she oversees the DTI's 16 regional offices nationwide. Um, here to deliver our welcome remarks um, on behalf of the Philippines and to introduce our keynote speaker, um, please give a warm round of applause for Undersecretary Zenaida Maglaya. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for skipping the number of years <laughs> in government, but I am proud to be in government. Secretary Rene Almendras, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Economies, representing the Investment Experts Group, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Cebu. It's a pleasure to me for me to be here today to discuss a topic that is very much in line with the theme of APEC 2015, building inclusive economies, building a better world, inclusive business. Overall, we find ourselves living in a time of extraordinary prosperity and human development where technological breakthroughs are enabling countless advances in connectivity, commerce, healthcare, energy, and so much more. In spite of this, however, there is one troubling fact. Income and wealth inequality is on the rise and shows no sign of slowing down. According to a report by Oxfam in 2014, the richest 85 people in the world have as much wealth as the poorest 3.5 billion, or half the world's entire population put together. Clearly, something needs to change. Everywhere today, it seems we can find innovations are being applied to design better apps, smarter technology, and more efficient processes. Our goal today in this public-private dialogue is to discuss and explore ways for this same innovative mindset, an approach to be applied to the creation of new business models that address the problem of growing or persistent inequality, all towards realizing Apex vision of sustainable growth and prosperity in the Asia Pacific region. 
We have with us today a distinguished and deeply knowledgeable set of speakers and resource people who will share with us their own insights and experiences in the development of inclusive business policies and criteria, as well as inclusive businesses leaders themselves. We will have an opportunity to learn about the business models of IBs from the Philippines, Mexico, and Indonesia across sectors such as agriculture, housing, and manufacturing. It is my hope that we will learn and be inspired by the stories we hear today, and that together we can advance the promotion and development of inclusive business models in our home economies and across APEC. In this way, together, we can build more inclusive economies. Together, we can build a better world. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a good day. And now allow me to introduce our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker is currently the Secretary to the Cabinet. He is tasked to effectively integrate and implement programs of the Aquino administration and ensure the effective coordination of policies and projects of the different departments and agencies of government. Prior to his appointment as the Secretary to the Cabinet, he served as the Secretary of the Department of Energy for almost three years. Under his leadership, the Department of Energy was ranked as one of the top 10 performers in a survey among 50 government agencies on government performance, specifically in ensuring integrity in public service. Our keynote speaker had a vast experience in the private sector where he spent most of his career before he decided to serve government under President Aquino. Throughout this time with the private sector, he assumed significant leadership roles with some of the top corporations in the country. Landing his first CEO position as the president of a bank at the age of 37, <laughs> he has come to be known, ito na po siya, he's been, he, he wants me to, to stop. He has come to be known for his success in driving the value of companies to be led and his craft in honing these companies to garner national and international recognitions and awards. <laughs> He said, you, you, when, we, when we talked earlier, you said, I just should be kind to you, sir. So let me just continue. <laughs> Don't worry, sir. These are all kind words. <laughs> he is an acknowledged international resource person on sustainable development and leadership. In 2011, he became one of the very few in the world to be acknowledged for sustainable leadership by the World Economic Forum. In June 2013, he was given the rare privilege of addressing the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations at its headquarters in Geneva, and then again in New York in December of the same year for the United Nations Special Meeting of the Economic and Social Council. Another one of his notable achievements as Secretary to the Cabinet, because it was his crucial role as when he was appointed by the President in resolving the Manila hostage crisis and continues to be pardon for lack of word, really the national troubleshooter of government whenever a crisis arises. <laughs> Except traffic, he said. <laughs> As a staunch uh, advocate of inclusive business and a leader in doing business at the base of the pyramid, the man who believes in servant leadership and aims to lead to serve others, a man who has a passionate advocacy of transforming through people development. Ladies and gentlemen, let us wel welcome our keynote speaker, the Honorable Secretary Jose Rene Almendras. Thank you, Jenny. When I meant being kind, I meant keep it short. <laughs> Jenny and I have been together in good times and bad times. We're together in Typhoon Pablo, we're together in Sajahatra Bangsamora, and many other programs in government. Let me simply say welcome, and do away with some of the protocol. After all, we are in Cebu, and I need to disclose, I was born here, I love this place, and I wish I continued to live here. Unfortunately, I've been kicked out of this place. So in behalf of the Cebuanos, I'd like to welcome all our foreign delegates. Cebu, if the Philippines, it's more fun in the Philippines, but I can tell you it's a lot more fun in Cebu. 
Now, if you haven't booked a trip up south to go swimming with the whales, to all our foreign delegates, this is a very good place to do it. It's not very expensive, and mind you, when I did it, I realized that the whales are a lot bigger than me. <laughs> and my daughter had a tremendously good time at it. But I do encourage all our foreign delegates, you are in Cebu, please enjoy the beach, enjoy the, the treats. Cebuanos are fun-loving and a warm breed of people. True to the testimony that the Filipinos are very hospitable. I also like to acknowledge the fact that about three years ago, in the same hotel, was the first time that the term inclusive business was discussed in the Republic of the Philippines. And unfortunately for me, I too was the speaker at that time. And it, was, it happened because the Philippine Business for Social Progress had a forum, and I was quite frustrated at some issues we had in government. So I told a good friend of mine, our partner here, Rapa Lopa, he says, you know, we've been driving inclusive growth in business, but we can't seem to get it moving as fast as we could. May we invite business to participate? And that's when we said inclusive business is the way to go. It's really an honor to be invited to speak because I'm quite passionate about this topic, other than the fact that it's a wonderful excuse to be out of the Malacanang Palace for a good number of hours and not in Metro Manila. And I need to assure Mr. Mitra that uh, I have been meeting with some stakeholders about the Metro Manila traffic. So we're not making a public announcement to that until we're ready with the plans. But we do our plan to do something about it. Let me begin also by congratulating the Department of Trade and Industry for this wonderful event, a chance for us to sit down, talk, private and public sector coming together. We need to explore avenues to engage the business and private communities towards inclusive business. I may have been, I'm still in government. I'm in government for, well, in a few days, I mean, a few months from now, hopefully not there. This is my first job in government and my last one, okay. And we're, I am one of those who's looking forward to stepping down. But honestly, in the many frustrations I've had coming from the private sector all my life in government, the topic of poverty, and in particular the topic of, in, of inclusive business is something that makes me feel good and makes me go back to work in the morning. A good portion of my time is spent with a, you see, we, in the Philippines we divided the cabinet into five clusters. First cluster is on economic development, we have a security cluster, we have a cluster on peace. We do have a cluster on climate change, that's how important climate change is. The fifth and my favorite cluster is the human development poverty reduction cluster, which I spend about 50% of my time on. Because, I mean, I, I do spend time there out of personal choice. How, how I conducted myself in government is highly influenced by many of the things I learned when I was in the private sector. And I did spend a lot more time in the private sector. Politics aside, the never-ending never challenge of trying to come up with solutions to just about every issue being raised to the office of the president brings also an opportunity to harmonize the private sector with the public sector. In every challenge that I've faced in government, we continue to face, we've always acknowledged that it's so important to talk to, work with, and cooperate with the private sector. And Mr. Mitra, that includes solving the Metro Manila traffic. Today, the Aquino administration is down to, and I'm very happy to report, exactly 308 days left. I do have a calendar in my office. It's a countdown calendar. When we started on day one, we really targeted poverty. And that's the reason behind our massive drive to do all possible investments and interventions at the base of the pyramid. Over the past five years, we worked hard to understand the dynamics of poverty, its location, and actual situation, as well as the unique situations in every poverty segment that we could find. A few years ago, government baseline data and focus was simply on poverty incidence, meaning total poor divided by total population in a province. But we expanded that to include poverty magnitude, and eventually, the, even the near poverty or the instant poverty areas caused by climate change situations. 
Poverty incidence requires implementation of structural, both hard and soft infrast changes. To mention, um, to mention an example, one of our highest poverty incidence provinces is, is up north. And the reason why it's, the area is so poor is there's not enough roads, there's no access, there's no electricity. And so how do you expect people to get out of poverty if you don't do that? However, if you start talking of poverty magnitude, and in this wonderful city of Cebu, and this my favorite province in the Philippines of Cebu, is number two in poverty magnitude, an embarrassment of sorts with all the development and growth here. The kind of intervention that's needed is not the same as that in a, in a province with high poverty incidence. And in a province where you have near poor or instant poor situations because of typhoons, earthquakes, landslides, like what we saw in Yolanda. The solutions are also different. We need to talk about mitigation, adaptations, we need to talk about quick relief operations that are meant to address this. Yolanda affected 1,011,000 households. My own personal estimate is it brought down from near poor or slightly above the poverty level back below the poverty level, close to, well, in my own personal estimate, at least half a million families. These were people who were not poor be before Typhoon Yolanda. They became poor after the typhoon. They, were pe they, they had homes, they probably had a TV set, they had a lot of the comforts of life, which they accumulated through the years of farming or of livelihood. But one incident, such as a typhoon, zeroes out your net worth, drives you below the poverty line, which is why government is also focusing on this sector. Another intervention that we started is mapping poverty. It's an ongoing process. The beauty is technology today is available. We learned that it was higher in the coconut farming areas. When you overlay the, the poverty map with the agriculture map, you will find significantly high correlation between coconut areas and poor. The second highest correlation is fishing only areas and poverty. And that's why we decided let's do something about it. I can spend a good day just discussing with you what we've learned on why people are poor in coconut areas. But we've started addressing all of these issues. The other advantage of mapping is that we are able to find the poor and study their situations, giving us a better understanding of the poverty structural realities where they are themselves in. At times, it's not about roads. At times, it's not about quality of soil or how abundant the land is. Sadly, a good number of poor areas is because of political situations. Now government has already identified and is carrying out accelerated programs that have proven effective to help improve lives and alleviate poverty. In fact, if not for the major typhoons and disasters, we would have had a greater reduction in the poverty numbers of the countries as we have today. Indeed, in five years, we have achieved quite a number of things. Most important is laying the groundwork for improving living conditions of the impoverished Filipinos. Filipino families through various transition programs. The Human Development Poverty Reduction Cluster of agencies in our administration account for 33.79% of the total national budget. So a third of what this country spends every year is targeted at human development and poverty reduction. Those are one of the things that we will leave behind to the next administration. Never has there been an investment to address poverty as this administration has done. And we put our money where our mouth is. Government has started investing in infrastructure and other anti-poverty programs. What we now need is for the private sector to come in with solutions that are efficient and effective and thus make the anti-poverty programs sustainable. Initially coined by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in 2005, <clears throat> various definitions and approaches have been conceptualized and introduced by different international institutions to enable the promotion of inclusive business in different parts of the world. 
which will be further discussed by very competent and expert speakers who will be speaking after me today. But at its very basic definition, it is a model that intends to encourage shared livelihood opportunities for all sectors of society and not in the usual business strategy targeting only a specific and often highly selected segment. Our population in the Philippines has breached 100 million. This is both an advantage and a disadvantage. I'd like to be more positive. Imagine the number of people that graduate or come out come of age to add to the country's labor force every year. Imagine the opportunities that we can give to these new Filipinos. We are at our demographic sweet spot. Traditionally, being in a demographic sweet spot gives the country a significant advantage, growth potential as far as the economy is concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, the possibilities for the Philippines is endless. And that's how I'd like to see the 100 million number. The only thing needed are more opportunities. This model particularly targets those at the base of the pyramid. There is, a micro, there is a misconception that investing in the poor is a lot more risky. But risk is always a part of business. That's how businesses, I mean, that's, it makes business more fun, actually. There are many advantages and disadvantages in investing in the poor. But if we think about it, sometimes it is even less risky to invest in the poor because of the situation that they actually find themselves in. Knowing the difficulty of landing a stable source of livelihood, they, of all people, are the ones who are most willing to aspire for employment, to learn new skills, putting in hard work and dedication as a guarantee to their efforts. Allow me to share a few examples of successful inclusive business success here and abroad. Very, very recently, as a matter of fact, a few weeks ago, you all know there's a massive drought in Western USA. There was a hype over an enigmatic product called Shade Balls that was rolled out into local reservoirs in the Los Angeles, California area. 96 million pieces of it. This product intends to help reduce the evaporation and block the sunlight from in sunlight from encouraging algae growth and toxic chemical reactions in the reservoir of water dams in the western U.S. area. In other words, they keep the reservoirs clean, intact, and reduce evaporation. The cost of each of these balls is about 36 cents, and they will last 25 years. What makes this product even more remarkable is the fact that Xavier C., the company that manuf invented and manufactured these balls hires disabled veterans who are having trouble finding work elsewhere, making them perform administrative, marketing, and other tasks. Shade balls not only succeed in putting up a viable and innovative business, but they're also helping in providing opportunities for a group of people who are disadvantaged. Inclusive business. We need to go, we need that go elsewhere. Here in the Philippines, let me cite a few examples. Let me give you an example of a pure private initiative. Very little prodding, very little help from government. Jollibee Food Corporation is a well-known local ex example of this. One of the largest quick service food chains, Jollibee came into the rea realization that they are in the best position to help improve the income of small farmers by linking them directly to the supply chain of institutional buyers like Jollibee Foods. And they did just that. Its daily requirements of raw ingredients such as rice, vegetables are sourced from local small scale farmers directly through its farmer entrepreneurship program started in 2008. Since then, the program has assisted 27 farmer groups from Luzon, Visayas and Mindanao. What's the advantage? Farmers' income almost doubled. Jollibee Foods Corporation reduced its raw material cost by at least 20%. Other companies with similar inclusive business ventures are Figaro Coffee Corporation that only source its Baraco coffee from what used to be marginal farmers in Cavite, but also add value to their crops by teaching them modern ways of planting, harvesting, and handling coffee post-harvest. 
And because they're fully integrated to Figaro outlets, their margins are fantastic for the farmers. San Pedro, I'm not going to give a homily. The Lechon Manok chain, which originally originated in Cagayan de Oro and is now all over Metro Manila, contracts its supply of chicken to about 2,000 small farmers all over the provinces and provided training on broiler breeding and handling to help them increase their productivity. Very close to the heart of Mamseni and the rest of the DTI family and myself is Hat Pablo. Typhoon Pablo wiped out six million coconut trees in the province of Davao Oriental. We found 1,700 families that lost their livelihoods. And if they were going to rely on coconut, needed to wait seven years before any gainful livelihood could be derived from it. Through the efforts of the Department of Trade and Industry, the rest of the national government, we launched the Hot Pablo Chile project. We taught people how to plant chili, how to dry them. Why? Because Dava Oriental does not have an ideal port. The road network from Dava Oriental to Davao City would take six and a half hours to do. So that if you were going to sell fresh chili, by the time they get to Davao City, shelf life would almost be nil. We launched the Hot Pablo drying project because we knew we could sell it. We were hoping we could sell it. Result, 10 million pesos a year in sales. Three, four dozen groups of farmers are now happily doing this. And through the efforts of DTI, we even export Hot Pablo products to Singapore, Malaysia, and hopefully Papua New Guinea. Sometimes, inclusive business can be made part and parcel of a government concession program. My own experience when I was in Manila Water, I used to travel the world in international conferences, many places, to talk about Tubig Para Sa Barangay. It was a program that we started targeting the very poor people in the urban centers of Manila. To connect them to water source, to make it affordable, to teach them, to educate them, and to make, it, to make it mainstream into their lives. And in certain places, it even became a livelihood opportunity. In Manila Water, we devolved meter protection. Instead of ordering it from Japan, we taught cooperatives how to make it. We devolved meter reading technology into groups of people who were living in the poorest sections in Manila. And the advantage was, because we engaged them, they stopped stealing water and became our guardians of the water network. It is a success story from a perspective of social dimension, an economic dimension, even an environmental dimension because the communities worked with us to keep water sources clean. Through the initiative, 1.6 million families had access to 24-hour water supply and a significant improvement in their health situation. Another example of government and private sector coming together are TESDA, Technical Training Institute of Government, partnering with Coca-Cola. TESDA has engaged in a similar venture through the store training and access resource. It's called STAR Program, in partnership with a Coca-Cola company. It was so successful that the most senior person of Coca-Cola International was here last month to witness for himself how successful the program was. Coca-Cola attested to, to empower 5 million women by 2020 through skills training, access to financial services, and support for merchandising and business assets. Truth be told, a Sari Sari store owner who used to earn only 400 to 500 a day now makes close to 4,000 pesos a day. What is it to Coca-Cola? You will never convince that store to sell Pepsi. <laughs> Coca-Cola is so happy with the program that they're now asking us to share what we have done here to Coca-Cola operations in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. And their request is, can we do it next month? Another example of government intervention 
that needed private sector support eventually is another project of the DTI, the Bohol Shared Service Facility. President Aquino flew to Bohol to personally lead the inauguration of a shared service facility in the earthquake-stricken municipality of Tubigon, Bohol. Originally intended as a rehabilitation project to a disaster area, DTI took the lead. The facility aims to revive Bohol's weaving industry, something which the Boholanos have been doing for hundreds of years already, particularly the material called raffia. Through the provisions of upright looms, accessories, and laboratory equipment that were turned over to the Tupigon Loom Weavers Multipurpose Cooperative, now they are supplying high-end quality raffia fabrics to prestigious clothing lines in, in Europe, such as Hermes and Louis Vuitton. Let me share with you one final example. Myself, I try to play golf every weekend. And I have a group of friends, six of us, who try to play golf every weekend. Four months ago, we decided to put a few thousand pesos together, each of us. We now have a venture in Dingalen, Quezon, involving three, 30 hectares, something like 17 families working with us. Part of the group is an Athenian who is now a faculty member in the AIM with a doctorate degree in management. Another member of the group is a senior vice president of an IT company, a medical company in, the, in Manila, and a few other guys with fantastic credentials. And we found ourselves talking after a game of golf saying, we have this group of farmers who are really having a hard time because the crop that they used to plant is no longer viable. We came to know of a particular herbal plant that a, that a particular business needed. We are very happy to report that we've already developed, of the 30 hectares, we've already developed 15 hectares. And what originally was calculated to be a return on investment of 30% may actually be close to 70% in the first year of operation. We have started planting high value crops and we're even planting strawberries which we brought in from Baguio. Why am I telling you this? Because I'm saying inclusive business need not be big, need not be high tech, need not be world changing. At the very least, the six golfers decided if this thing doesn't fall through, then we'll have a regular supply of vegetables. But as it is turning out, the lives of these 17 families that we've started working with their incomes have now more than doubled. My suggestion is you don't need to look far. You don't need to look way, way out there in a provincial area. The opportunities of inclusive business can happen where you are already in. Inclusive business is undoubtedly here, and it works, and there is no question about it. It is viable and profitable. What we can do in government is ensure that the necessary facilities and infrastructure are in place to create an enabling environment conducive for business opportunities to prosper. We build roads, bridges to provide and encourage access, reduce logistics costs, and assist in creating the necessary market linkages to be able to reach out to the locals as well as other industries. However, such government efforts can only do so much. We are counting on you, the private sector, to come and join government's inclusive growth program with inclusive business. And do what you do best. You bring in the discipline, the creativity, the entrepreneurial spirit that is needed to establish and adopt business models that will promote effective and efficient structures that will result in sustainable livelihood for a very long time. Thank you very much and welcome to Cebu again. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Almendras. Um, are you guys all still with me?